Now let's move on to the next type of convection, which is the natural or free convection. To explain natural convection, here is a figure of a plate that is hot, and then there's this hot air caused by the hot plate. So imagine this um, bulk of air being heated because of the hot plate, and then the, there's this cold air outside of it. And then this cold air mixes through bulk mixing with the hot air. And in this case, the natural phenomenon exists and this is called the natural convection or free convection. Like, like what I'm telling you before, convection would always employ something like a natural phenomenon, usually caused by the exposure of a certain material with temperature gradient and density differences. Now, in natural convection, we will be tackling about the external natural convection, that is, convection that happens on the external of materials or of various geometries. This will include the vertical plates and the horizontal plates, as well as the horizontal and vertical cylinders. Now, there's also this boiling, and this is one of the best examples that natural convection would employ. Um, when you were in high school or in elementary, your teachers would always um, explain convection in a way that they would um, give examples as natural convection, like the sea breeze or um, the air that mixes with um, any cold air or the inversion that happens in the atmosphere. So boiling for one is another. and there are just two types of boiling. Here we have the pool boiling and the flow boiling. Now, in this discussion, we'll only be um, focusing on pool boiling simply because when we consider flow boiling, that will mean that the fluid inside flows. And if the fluid inside flows, you would logically think that there should be some kind of device that moves this fluid. And for that, that will be forced convection if it will be flow boiling. So we'll be considering pool boiling in this case. And pool boiling happens when there is a, a huge amount of fluid or liquid or gas that is in contact with a hot or a cooler surface. And then this temperature gradient would cause this boiling to occur. Boiling is also scientifically the vaporization that happens. and under the pool boiling, we ha do have some two types, again, which is the nucleate boiling and then the film boiling or the critical heat flux boiling. Now, let me discuss first all about this graph. Now, what you can see here in this graph is the temperature um, or the heat flux against temperature. And this is the profile of our boiling. Now. There's this nucleate boiling and film boiling. Now, I want you to understand that during boiling, for example, you try to boil um, water in a, in a kettle. Now, it will start by the natural convection boiling. That is, the, the fluid that is in contact with the surface would um, go upwards and then the cold would, will go downwards and then this... Um, cycle will just um, continue and continue until we reach a point where the isolated bubbles start. That is the time when you would see something like um, a tiny bubble on the surface of the of the heating medium. And in that case, after some time, after addition of some kinetic, I mean, after addition some heat, the temperature would still increase and then that bubble will escape from the surface of that. Um, heating medium. This process will proceed until it reaches a point where there's a burnout point. This is the maximum heat that would we'll be employing to our heat flux and this burnout point would is noticeable in such a way that it, the bubbles would form something like this. It's no longer um, circular but it somehow looks like this um, elongated object. Um, elongated drops. So this is what happens when nucleate boiling would reach its um, highest point. And at that point, it suddenly go the heat flux suddenly goes down 
to proceed with this transition boiling or we have this unstable film meaning there is a complete mixing between the transition or the filming and then this nucleate boiling and after this transition we call this point the laden frost effect in which it signals the start of the film boiling now nucleate boiling is very common when you try to like heat some water or boil water for your coffee in the morning that's nucleate boiling but film boiling is much more uh, less common and uh, what I would like to emphasize in this film boiling is that when you in in ex by experience when you try to cook if you wanted to fry a lot of foods or meals um, you would see that if you have a pan and it, this pan was left heated for quite some time now what you would see there is that if you would add some droplets of water the droplets would actually roll on the pan and not vaporize so if this is the pan that you're heating so let's say we have a pan here and then there's this fire and then you try to like sprinkle water instead of the water vaporizing or boiling it would just flow as if it's like a frictionless um, ball flowing through the pan i don't know if you've um if you've experienced something uh, like that but for those who are chefs wannabe i know they have seen something like this we call this the laden frost effect and what happens here is actually the start of film boiling when we talk about film boiling this is what we call the film this is actually a vapor and the moment these droplets made in contact with a very hot pan that is the temperature of the pan would be very high compared to the temperature of water so in this case if the droplets or the droplet makes contact with the pan this portion of the liquid instantly evaporates so it becomes vapor so in this case literally the droplets are something like floating on this pan because there exists some vapor here that is of course makes the bubbles float i mean the droplets float and this laden frost effect would be evident for droplets but if we're talking about pool boiling that is a very huge amount of liquid so of course that if you would try to like um, have more fluid here then uh, this vapor will no longer be able to like um, float this droplet since this is very heavy so instead a vapor layer is formed and that's how we call it film boiling because there's actually a film that is formed during boiling and that exists to a very very high temperature usually it would look like some gaseous um, I mean gaseous cloud escaping from the surface that is very hot okay so that's how it goes for boiling it would start with this natural convection boiling and end up with film boiling but usually um, we try to like um, do nucleate boiling in our home and in this industrial processes uh, this film and nucleate boiling play a vital role in heat efficiency imagine if you have something like a very hot um, let's say a very hot a nuclear power plant so the steam would actually not vaporize but it will form a layer in the film boiling now it will cause the heat to have a very low efficiency since since there's a resistance that is applied through the surface now if there's boiling of course there's a condensation and there are just two types of cond condensation that is associated with natural convection the drop wise and the film condensation now the most common that you would see is the film con is the dropwise condensation this is the dropwise condensation so this this dropwise condensation is very evident when you try to like um, add some cold water on a glass and then you let this glass um, stay for some time you would see that um, there will be droplets around the glass and then after some time if you're not actually um, moving it these droplets would flow downwards and then you'd see the mark of the water so that's dropwise condensation actually the word drop would give you a hint that it somehow forms droplets and then it will just flow due to gravity now 
film condensation is much more evident in industrial processes. This type of condensation happens when the, uh, this material, for example, this is a metal, and it is very, um, this is very frictionless, meaning it's smooth. So if water condenses through this, so instead of being formed, the liquid will eventually flow down along this uh, material. So unlike this drop ice condensation where we have some surface tension that is being built up here and the resistance would offer some kind of um, the resistance would give some time for the bubbles to accumulate and then it will drop because of its weight. Now that's the difference between this film condensation because typically this um, drop ice condensation happens when the material is rough compared to this that is being um, smooth. So uh, this film condensation if you would see there um, if you take a look at the side view of that you would see something like a film of water and this is this water comes from this hot vapor the saturated vapor that is being condensed through this and by the way condensation happens when we have a saturated vapor that is we have a value of the temperature here that is saturation temperature if it meets for example this metal that is below its saturation temperature it will automatically have some kind of condensation and the same thing goes for boiling if the saturated temperature of a liquid water would meet a temperature that is outside its or above its saturation temperature then what will happen is simply the liquid will start to boil so that's how it goes for our condensation I mean natural I mean convection natural or free so we will be discussing all about the external for various geometries boiling and then of course this condensation so in a way that we want to explain more of this natural convection we will be employing the dimensionless numbers again we used to have these four are three or four we have four we use this in forced convection and typically these are just you know ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces that's the Reynolds number and then this prandle is the thermal diffusive momentum diffusivity to thermal diffusivity and then we have this Nusselt number that is um, the thermal conductivity resistance the ratio of the resistance of thermal conductivity with its um, you know convective resistance of the material and now this specklet number is the product of the Prandtl and Reynolds number that uh, we didn't actually use that but that's the product now in this natural convection we will be employing another dimensionless number which is the Rayleigh number from the scientist Lord Rayleigh this Rayleigh number would employ the product of the ratio of the buoyancy force and viscous forces with the momentum diffusivity and the thermal diffusivity v. now we also have this Grashof number and uh, and like the Peclet number uh, this Grashof number would actually be something like the ratio of the Rayleigh and the Prandtl number so the equations of this I will give you when we try to solve problems but for now let's just have some concept that that is involved this Grashof number is buoyancy the ratio of buoyancy and viscosity forces so they are used in a way that um, there is a change in phase for our heat transfer and then this one the bond or Voss number uh, these two I mean this number is called in such a way because uh, there are two proponents of this number so bond or Voss number actually gives us an idea of the shape of a bubble so uh, and, and in, in this lesson will not be actually like um, drawing or solving for the curvature of a bubble that is formed but I just wanted you to like um, add some information about this is that if we're trying to characterize bubble um, through some kind of uh, capillarity and um, gravitational force so the relationship would exist and the bond or at vast number would be the one that we'll be using so I think it also exists in your various handbook so I'll just be 
I'm giving you the page where it can be found. I mean, dimensionless numbers are written there, almost all of it, but I, some of it will be can be found along some other chapters not included in that table. So with that, let's try solving some problems so that you can understand how this um, con natural convection works. So now for us to understand natural convection in a deeper manner, let's try to solve one of the problems that I have included in your module. And I want you to pause the video and understand this problem and go back here after you've read it. Again, natural convection employs the three major steps in problem solving that, and those are the, uh, number one would be the identification of the condition, or just determine all the necessary things that we need in order to select the appropriate equation and then finally we evaluate that to get the thing that the problem needs and in this case if we were to determine the condition we just have to analyze that uh, this horizontally this horizontal cylinder is actually placed in a pool of water and if imagine if if a tube is placed um, under a pool of water, you could imagine this um, pool or water encapsulates the whole material and in a way that if there is no force, I mean if there are no movement caused by mechanical means, we could simply say that this is an example of natural convection. Uh, and uh, the only reason that this natural convection exists is that this material is exposed to the environment that is I mean, at still. So uh, we usually define this something like uh, before the pool boiling, meaning that we boil something because of the fluid that is around a heating surface, which is uh, not moving. So it is something like this, but the difference is that the, um, the surface of the cylinder is not boiling. It's just, um, I mean, it's hot, but it's not, you know, boiling or something. So. In this case, let's have the given. So we have the diameter that is equal to two centimeters. And then we have the horizontally, I mean the pool of water that is at the 70 degrees Fahrenheit temperature. So we represent that as the 70 degrees, I mean the TE. And then the surface would be the TS. That's 130 deg degrees Fahrenheit. And we need to find the heat loss by the cylinder per meter of length. So as what I've mentioned before, in any case you wanted to solve convection, you just have to employ this one equation. That's Q is equal to AH and then TS minus TE. And if we would be substituting A with the area that is on our, in, I mean, the area that is um, in evaluation, so the area would be pi DL and then the convective heat transfer coefficient and then ts minus te since we need q over l so that will be q over l it is equal to pi d and then h and then ts minus te now uh, if we would check on our given we already have this ts and te we already also have this d and we're now left with h and uh, h is the thing that we need to find here and we need to find the equation for that and Remember, the nozzle number would always give us the relationship with H, and that is H D over K. That's the same for natural convection, wherein the D is the diameter. And let's just um, use like a small D just to make it consistent. So with that, we need to find the correlation of this nozzle number if we have it. So actually we do have it and in your Paris handbook if you will be reading this under the natural convection section you will see here a lot of equations and that's the external natural flow of various geometries. Under this would be the for laminar and turbulent flow and isothermal horizontal cylinder. So this is where we will be um, finding our equation and in this case I'll be using this So this is what we need right now. So the nozzle number here with with L here states that you need to evaluate the nozzle number 
into the element that is in study or in consideration. So in this case, we're considering the diameter here. So it's like n, u, and then d in this case. So uh, the thing is, a uh, parental number is not new to you. This parental number is just the cp mu over k. But the Rayleigh number would be the one that is kind of new to us. So Rayleigh, Rayleigh number, which is evaluated at the diameter, that is simply equal to the to beta, then delta t, and then g x cubed, rho squared, and then cp. Then we divide this all by the viscosity and then k. Now let me um, uh, di dissect all of these. So cp is the specific heat capacity we also used to solve for this and all of the things here all the properties they must be evaluated at the film temperature so the density here is rho x here would mean that uh, the element in consideration so in this case that is our diameter so let's just have some x would be our d and then g here is the acceleration due to gravity delta t would be the difference in temperature between the free or the surface and then the environment and then this beta here uh, let's just first start with mu the mu here is the dynamic viscosity and then case the thermal conductivity now the thing that would be very new to you is this beta and then beta is actually the volumetric expansion coefficient so if we have something like beta here for gases beta is actually equal to 1 over the temperature but since this is just for gases, so and our example is actually liquid since we have water, pool of water. So we need to find beta in a way that we'll not be using this formula since this is just for the gases. So don't forget to do that since if you will be using the, the beta for gases, then you'll get a wrong answer. So keep in mind that you should be checking the condition first we have water here and not g a gas so you need to find the, the volumetric coefficient of expansion of that liquid so with that let's check on the Paris handbook if we have you know, but be, but before that let's just solve for the Prandtl number since we have been solving this ever since so that's just cp mu over k and we need to find this cp mu and k and all of these will be evaluated at the film temperature so let's just write here the film temperature that is 100 um i think 30 and 70 yes so that's 130 degrees fahrenheit and then 70 so we take the average of that to get the film temperature so the film temperature is 100 degrees fahrenheit but all of the data in our paris handbook are in um, Kelvin or um, as a unit so we need to convert this to Kelvin and uh, in Kelvin this is um, around 310.9278 so that's in Kelvin so that's around um, 37.7 repeating degrees Celsius so that's it for our film temperature so we need to evaluate our brand at film temperature so let's get all the data we have the cp at the film so the cp at the film is equal to 4178.4758 that's joule per kilogram kelvin and if you're wondering again where, where did i get those data you just have to check on your paris handbook for chapter 2 and then head on to the thermodynamic properties of water that should be um, around after Tolubin so in 8th that's 2-413 so you'll be having this data here and you just need to interpolate and we'll be interpolating somewhere at 310 so if we want to like highlight this or you just have to interpolate in between these values okay and that's where I got my data so to counter check you should be interpolating as well so that's the film temper uh the film specific heat capacity and we need our viscosity dynamic at the film temperature so that is 6.8273 times 10 to the negative 4 and the unit will be pascal second 
you also have our thermal conductivity at this film temperature so you're not required to write something like f sub f in any kind of physical property here because it is already given that you should be evaluating at the temperature but i would always like to write something like this just to remind you that you need to you know interpolate at that values because the answer will be wrong even if it's close enough to the real answer so the thermal conductivity is 0 0.6273 and remember the unit will be in watts per meter kelvin so in this case we can now obtain the Prandtl number so before we get the Prandtl number let's just head on to this since um, we just need here the density I think and then the volumetric coefficient of expansion so let's take the density at the film temperature so that will be equal to 993.237 um, t that is kilograms per cubic meter so we now have this we now have all the data we need and except for beta and for beta let's check on the Paris handbook so that we can understand where will we be getting the data here so you should always head on the physical and chemical data for any kind of data that you need for that's the general rule for Paris handbook and you can see here a lot from water vapor densities and etc etc so let's take a look at the thermal expansion and we have the linear we have the linear the um, volumetric so we need to head on the volume expansion of liquids so I would also like to um, give you an idea that if we have something like a linear expansion of a solid or even some kind of liquid the linear expansion would give you something like uh, three times of that linear expansion would give you the volumetric expansion of that substance that's why sometimes they don't actually write this volumetric for the substances here or the metals here since uh, yeah, it's written here that, that it's three times the linear coefficient so that's how it goes for usually for metals but but of course in cases where we'll be considering liquids which is more I mean they're more I mean indeed they're different they behave differently than metals so let's check on this and you can see here that the volume of the volume expansion of liquids I've already checked on the ninth edition and it's already there so you can also check on that read about all of this and then what you can see here is um, the alpha beta and gamma and then the correct or the true coefficient of volume of expansion so um, let me just explain a little about this because in here you're given by all of these values and it says here that the final volume is actually equal to the initial volume multiplied with 1 plus all of the stuff here multiplied with t, t squared and t cubed. The t here is actually the temperature, the, uh, the change in temperature with reference to 0 degrees Celsius. So basically the temperature here should be in degrees Celsius. So, so in this case if I would be using this as a, my reference or my equation for the therm, I mean the volumetric thermal expansion coefficient so I'll be having something like Vt is equal to Vo and then 1 plus alpha t and then plus beta t squared plus and then something like gamma t cubed and by the way I would like to say, tell you that this beta here is not the same as the beta that we need in um, in this section okay it's a different story for this it's just the, what the Paris handbook used so it says here at the latter portion of our sentence uh, the values of the coefficient of volume expansion of liquids can be derived from the tables of specific volumes of the saturated liquid given as a function of temperature later in this section so what we mean by this is that this c is the true coefficient of volume of expansion so it can be uh, it is given in a form of uh, this differential equation so the volumetric um, expansion coefficient it, in this case it is C that is given by dV over dt and then just multiply with the reciprocal of the initial so that's how it goes for our C and it says here that you can actually solve for C by taking the saturated liquid um, table 
given as a function of temperature later in this section. So in as I look at this um, section, I couldn't see it and and probably they're referring to another section of this uh you know thermodynamic properties or tables but in any way let's try to like um evaluate what could be the answer for this so generally if if you're if you're considering this um equation here what you have here is the final volume and then the initial volume so if you would be asked about the expansion coefficient of that what what you will have in mind would be something like the ratio of the final over the initial would give me the expansion coefficient of the volume itself but remember beta is actually um, the unit for beta is actually Kelvin the reciprocal of temperature so in this case you have to like divide this by uh, the temperature so in that way we could understand that it is better for us to use um, the general expression of our uh, volumetric expansion which is this which is this differential equation here and it says here that if you take the derivative of v with respect to t and then divide it with the initial you can get the volumetric coefficient so let's take a look at this if we set vo as something that is constant in this manner since we're evaluating v the final velocity i mean the final volume here so if i would be taking the derivative of our volume with respect to the temperature in this um, equation I would be getting VO that's just a constant here and then and then we since one is a constant so I'll be left out with alpha and then plus 2 beta and then plus uh, 3 I mean this one is beta T and then 3 gamma T squared so I'll be left out with this uh, since this is the derivative and then if I'll be di dividing this by VO, I'll be getting this expression the same as our C. So in this manner, I have obtained the, sorry, in this manner, I have already obtained the equation for our volumetric coefficient of expansion, and that is given this formula. And upon solving, so you should be able to get the volumetric expansion coefficient at any temperature in degrees Celsius so so if you have something like 20 degrees Celsius you just have to like substitute here 20 degrees and you should be getting the answer by simply using the alpha beta and gamma that is stated in here but what does it mean by this you know true coefficient of volume of expansion the reason is is that uh, this derivation is actually just an um, I mean it's an estimate to the volumetric expansion coefficient so this is just applicable for example for water it's for 0 to 33 degrees Celsius and it's some kind of it has still some deviation if you would look closely at this value if you'll be solving that and substituting that to let's say 20 degrees Celsius you will not be getting this 0 0.207 and that's because uh, these um, equations here they're just you know experiments obtained I mean values from experiments obtained and if I would um, take a look at the acetic acid and then solve for this it will be very close for these values for some of this but for water it will be kind of I mean it's not really that close enough to this C so what will you be doing for that case since this could probably not be applicable in such cases but we're already given with that probably you might be thinking I should somehow use water at 20 degrees Celsius since it's already given here but uh, the thing is we need to be more more most accurate in solving problems and 0.207 is for 20 degrees Celsius but in the film temperature we need around something like 37.7 degrees Celsius so in this manner you'll be focusing on what is said here that you need you can take or you can find the volume of coefficient of expansion for liquids by from the saturated liquid condition so in this case I'll be heading to another section here at the physical and chemical data which is the densities by the way just to make it clear I'm not telling that it I'm not telling you that it is wrong it's just that it is less accurate than using this 
kind of method that we'll be using. So as you can see here, you have the density of saturated liquid from the ripple point to its critical point. And if you would understand this C, which is the volumetric expansion coefficient, it says here that you have this um, change in the volume and then the temperature and then divided by the VO. So roughly, we could say that if this is the change in the volume, we could say that this is V2 minus V1 and then this one is T2 or T2 minus T1. It's the temperature is just written and a small t. And then we divide this by the initial volume and in this case that will be 1. So oh, why just not use this? So we can use this but uh, remember this dv over dt is actually the I mean it's in a form of derivative so um, we can roughly estimate this v2 minus v1 but if we need dv we need the infinite the infinitesimal change so infin never mind the spelling <laughs> so the infinitesimal change would be something like it is the change in which there should be something like a very small difference between the values so what do I mean by this that if I have let's say 272 value and then 273 you could say that dv would be v2 minus v1 but I could also say that that's also equal I mean at the middle of this would be 272.5 minus 272 that's also dv and dv is actually what makes it more accurate is that as we come very close to the value that is in between these two I mean if you have 272 point let's say 006 this dv would be more accurate than producing dv here since 0.5 is a lot I mean the increment from 0.5 from 272 would be much much greater than 0 0.006 so you know what I mean this um, dv would be as as much as possible, you need to select the data that are very close to each other. And that's the reason why I took you to this um, section. Because as you can see, it's just the density. We also have that in the thermodynamic properties. But remember, the thermodynamic properties would give you densities or specific volumes at, let's say, the increment. I think it's 10. So from 274, it becomes something like 284. So if we need dv we need to select the data that are very close to each other at least so in this case if i need 37.7 which is 310 i need to take on the values of 310 here and around 312 so this is how it goes for that one and if i'll be using that for the thermodynamic properties i'll be getting values around 310 and then i think it's 320 so with that let's do it for our value here and in this case, I'll be taking V2 and then, I mean, I need to find our V2, which is the uh, the volume 2 and then the volume 1, also the temperature 1 and then the temperature 2. So remember, if we have something like 310.9278 Kelvin here and it says here that we have 310, so therefore our T1 is actually 310 since it's a lot closer than 300 than 312 and then T2 would be something like equal to our final temperature that is 310.9278 so that's 310.9278 so as you can see here the increment here is just 0.9278 so it's better to use that than in our thermodynamic properties in our um, Paris handbook and then V2 the thing that we need so this V2 is actually volume so we just need to take the reciprocal of this density so we get a specific volume and V1 is for 310 so that's 993.342 so we have 1 over 993.342 so by interpolation what we'll be getting here is the value of our v2 so the value of our v2 upon interpolation would be 993.002 so I need to take the reciprocal of that so that we can get the specific volume. And then with that, let's do this. So roughly dv over dt times 1 over v o would be equal to v2 minus v1 over t2 minus t1 times 1 over v1. And that will be equal to um, this 1 over 993. 0.0024 minus 1 
over 993.342 and then divided by 310.9278 minus 310 and then we multiply that with 1 over VO so we could just um, use something like the density here. So the volumetric expansion coefficient is equal to 3.6861 times 10 to the negative 4 and the unit will be per Kelvin. So in this case, we already have our beta and then I want you to like um, check on this and try to substitute T as something like 37.7 degrees Celsius and then alpha, beta and gamma here will be those that are obtained from this table and by the way since of course you will be getting a very different answer well for the reason one one reason is that this is not accurate as accurate as using that one and then the other one is that this is just applicable for 0 to 33 so i mean even if you have 0 to 33 values i would still recommend you to like do the thing that we need that we did here I think it's much easier for you to like do this instead of deriving from this and then you're not getting the accurate one. So this is our beta here and now since we've already obtained uh, the values that we need, so let me just um, copy here and then place it somewhere here so that we complete, we can complete now our um, physical properties. Let's just write it. So 3.6861 um, times 10 to the negative 4. So the unit is per Kelvin. So we're done with all of the given. So let's just find it. The, ra the Rayleigh, the Prandtl, and all of this stuff. So I think I'll just be um, removing this since we'll not be using this anymore. And I just get con I may just get confused with that. So Let's have our Prandtl number first. So the Prandtl number is simply Cp mu over k. So that is Cp mu over k. So upon substitution, you get the Cp mu k. The Prandtl number would be equal to 4.5477. And then the Rayleigh number, the diameter. So you just have to substitute all of these values. And typically, rate uh, the Rayleigh number would give you a very high value. And if you would have um, a very high value for a Rayleigh number, then it's almost as if it's correct. And don't get to over, I mean, I don't know, probably questioning yourself since the value is really high. The Rayleigh number is actually very high. So upon substitution with all of these, so probably we could just write it. You might as well want to write the units for you to understand how it cancels out. But in this case, since I've already written them in its SI units before, so I don't have to like write it anymore. But I re I'd recommend you to write it. So the Rayleigh number, the Rayleigh number at this, uh, the value here would be equal to nine two eight two nine three two point. 713 and that's around 9,282,932 so it's 9.2 times 10 to the 6 so that's our Rayleigh number and for yeah we already get obtained the Prandtl number so we can now substitute all of these values to the Nusselt number that we have so the Nusselt number would be equal to So upon solving this, the Nusselt number is 
actually equal to 33.4273 and with this this is equal to our ht over k which is again equal to h times our 0 0.02 that's in meter and then our thermal conductivity is equal to 0 0.6273 so uh, let's add some meter here and then watts per meter kelvin so in this case our h would have a value of um, 1048.4464 and then it will be watts per meter squared kelvin so now we've already obtained our heat convective heat transfer coefficient for condensation then we can now proceed with i mean condensation for natural convection of various geometries so we can now substitute that with our equation so q and that is q over l actually is equal to pi and then d and then h and then ts minus te that's q over l is equal to pi and then the diameter is 0 0.02 meters meter and then 1048.4464 that's what per meter squared and then kelvin and then we have here ts minus t that will be 130 uh, degrees Fahrenheit minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit but since this is in English we need to convert this to SI so 1.8 so degrees Fahrenheit and this one is degrees Celsius so we can now cancel all of these and then we're left with just watts per meter so Q over L is equal to 2195 point eight six one zero that's watts per meter okay so this is so this is the answer for your problem here which asks about the heat transfer um, heat loss by the cylinder per meter of length so that's all for this external convection